Hey there, and welcome back to another DreamWorks video. And recently, I made a video talking about the ins and outs of the B-movie, and how, based on the balance of positive and negative, it's a borderline crime against humanity. Like seriously, who thought that film about a bee romancing a flower shop owner, who's also a human whose fiancé is allergic to bees and thus is somehow positioned as the antagonist, was a good idea? Like, I know they say the whole sexual undertones were unintentional, but whether you believe that or not, it's still there. It's weird, and it shouldn't have been made. Only the memes should survive. Delete the rest. DreamWorks needs to have a nice long look in the mirror and ask themselves, how does weird shit like that make it past the initial pitch? But at least it's not all bad for DreamWorks. They have made some great films and franchises. Shrek, Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon, just to name a few. But I don't want to talk about those films today. We know they're good, and we know why they're good. What they did right, what they did wrong, they're still talked about today. They have that worldwide recognition. They're iconic franchises, each of them. And so today, I want to spotlight a film that I honestly think deserves a little bit more recognition, a little bit more prestige and love. A film that's sort of been left behind despite it being quite a fun and exciting movie that did well with both critics and audiences. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this bad boy's underrated, because it's not, but maybe it's just a little bit overshadowed? It needs more love. So many awesome films from the past sort of just get shuffled off to the side after a couple years, and I don't want this to happen to this one. But anyway, of course, that film is Over the Hedge. Released in 2006, Over the Hedge tells the story of RJ, a raccoon who finds himself in the deadly sights of Vincent, a bear who's a popular tourist attraction and is given a lot of food by visiting humans. Of course, being a fool, RJ thinks that it's a perfectly smart and reasonable idea to try and steal from this bear. He, of course, fails and accidentally destroys all of it, leaving him with an ultimatum of a week to restore what was lost or Vincent will hunt him down and kill him. Meanwhile, a group of woodland animals consisting of Vern the turtle, Hammy the squirrel, Stella the skunk, a family of porcupines, and a father and daughter opossum wake up from their hibernation to find the majority of their forest has somehow been completely converted into a suburban neighborhood in just a handful of months. And like, not slightly, but full conversion. Very efficient builders. Anyway, frightened about their future and where they're going to find enough food to survive, the group are found by RJ, who quickly begins to teach them about the blessings of human settlement and helps them steal food from the neighborhood, creating a new stockpile which he intends to hand over to Vincent once he double-crosses the critters. However, despite their success, their newfound activities catch the attention of the local president of the Homeowners Association, and she hires an exterminator, called the Verminator, to catch and kill the critters which in turn causes conflicts within the animal family as Vern blames RJ and tries to return the food, which just makes him an outcast from the rest. Eventually, the group reunite for a heist, but are double-crossed by RJ who steals the food and leaves them to be captured by the exterminator. However, after abandoning them, RJ has a last-minute change of heart, decides to save them instead, and this in turn pisses off Vincent as he needs to use the food to do so. And so, the animals then need to contend with Vincent, the angry bear, the Psycho Homeowners Association lady, and an overly enthusiastic exterminator who actually seems to enjoy the concept of slaughtering helpless woodland animals. And after a quick confrontation, the animals trick the trio into getting trapped by an illegal pest control machine, the Depelter Turbo. And whilst Vincent shipped off to the Rockies, the humans are arrested and shamed, and our woodland friends live happily ever after. And all in all, I think the film did very well for itself. Whilst it wasn't a huge box office sensation, it certainly did better than I expected coming into it, grossing $340 million off of a budget of $80 million. And I mean, that's pretty decent in my opinion. Yeah, it wasn't quite what they were hoping for, but you can't tell me that that's a bad gross for a film that, when you first look at it, doesn't really seem like it's going to be all that good. Although, on the other hand, it was a gross low enough that it killed off a potential sequel because the studio was afraid that the sequel would make even less money. So, take that as you will. And then, from a critical perspective, it also has a very respectable 75% on Rotten Tomatoes, averaging a 6.8 out of 10 and a score of 67 out of 100 on Metacritic. And, you know, maybe the average rating could afford to go up a little higher, but I think the percentage at the very least is quite fair. Because yeah, this isn't a Pixar mega hit or one of Disney's greats. It isn't even one of DreamWorks' best works, but it is a fun family film, and that's really all there is to it. But enough about all that. Let's actually move on to what makes this film so fun to watch. What makes it so enjoyable and exciting. And for one, I think that a big part of the fun is simply the story itself. 
or the way in which the story is presented. In a lot of animated films, there's a bit of downtime for talking and character discussion, or even outright just singing. And these often help develop emotion and add some more depth to the story. But here, I wouldn't say that there's no emotional development. After all, there are a few more subdued moments during the film, e.g. the scene where the Ben Folds song still plays. <sighs> we'll come back to the music later, but damn, I love that scene. And these scenes really do add a good emotional contrast to what would otherwise be a pretty much balls-to-the-wall action-adventure heist movie. From the moment RJ arrives and meets the animals and instigates the theft of food from human homes, the movie just goes bananas with action. And I think that that very much helps to set it apart somewhat from a lot of other films of its era. Hell, even today, the popular style for the top animated studios are largely character-driven adventures that heavily balance action with slow and emotional scenes. Over the Hedge openly shuns that formula and says, but what if we had more action? And then almost as an afterthought, they think, ooh, better have an emotional scene. Let's add a sad song. And my God, it just works. The film just goes so hard, and then out of nowhere, it's just all sad face. And then it's going hard again. Hell, even the emotional reunion and forgiveness scenes at the end of the film are against the backdrop of hiding in a hedge as a bear is on one side and an exterminator and an angry homeowner with a weed whacker are on another. And on top of that, the plot itself is very simple. Animals steal food and fight back against humans whilst learning the meaning of family. It doesn't try too hard to make you think. It doesn't have too many hidden themes and messages. It is by and large a popcorn movie. It focuses heavily on silly toilet humor and fart jokes and silliness and craziness and then action and explosions as well. And that's okay. Not everything needs to push boundaries and break new ground every single minute. Some films should just be made to give the audience a good time. And that's what Over the Hedge does. It's what it's all about, a good time. It also helps that the film doesn't outstay its welcome. It goes for 83 minutes and that's hardly any time at all these days. It compacts all that action into an hour and 20 minutes and successfully prevents you getting bored, which is something you really love to see. Theoretically, they could have extended this bad boy for another 20 minutes, but they didn't, and it was a good choice. Too many films these days think they need to push an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes, and they end up bloating the film with unnecessary scenes and dead space. But Over the Hedge doesn't do this. It doesn't let itself have that bloat, and because of the fast pace, I think the quality of the film benefits as a result. But that being said, the pacing and the simplistic action-packed storyline are all well and good. But in the interest of fairness, I do have to admit that this does combine to ensure that character development is kind of kept to a minimum. We have some pretty clear stereotypical roles for our characters. RJ, the heartless con artist. Vern, the wet blanket leader. The concerned parent porcupines. The rebellious and wild children. The coward. The independent woman. The sweet simpleton. They're pretty defined archetypes and they don't develop outside them all that much, other than RJ becoming nicer and Vern becoming less of a stick in the mud. And, you know, it's not exactly the worst thing in the world that they never change or develop or grow, but at the same time, it definitely is something that holds the film back quite a lot. Even if I think that extending out the story would have just damaged the plot and pacing, this comes at the cost of the characters. So really, there is no winning here with this film. A film like this does have to sacrifice things. And because of that, it never really had a chance to ever hit that top tier. But back to some positives, I gotta say, the music in this movie is unexpectedly good, especially the three original songs by Ben Folds. They're just, mwah, perfection. I honestly think that DreamWorks does have some of the best scoring in animated films, but they really do punch above their weight in terms of soundtracks in comparison to some of the other studios, who you kind of expect to have these good soundtracks. But DreamWorks just, goes under the radar and pulls out a real winner of a score time after time. Shrek did it. Shrek 2 did it. And this film is just another in a long line of this. And once again, the majority of these songs are punchy and exciting. And then that really emotional song to balance things out. And often the scoring in films is the unsung hero. And this one really just helps to make the film so much better. Without it, it does drop quite a lot in quality. But anyway, there's not really that much else to say. The film isn't perfect but it does what it needs to do, and it's one of my favorite B-level animations of the 2000s. But with that being said, these are just my opinions, and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the film? Do you think it's great like I do? Do you like it even more than me, maybe? Or do you think it's pure trash? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know.